I regard myself as a soldier, though a soldier of peace. I have a dream that one day a soldier of peace this nation will rise up a soldier of peace live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream so a soldier of peace. I have a dream that one day Nonviolence Radio, covering the beat of nonviolence worldwide from the Meta Center for Nonviolence in Petaluma, California. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Nonviolence Radio. I'm your host, Stephanie Van Hook of the Meta Center for Nonviolence, and I'm here in the studio with my co host and news anchor, Michael Nagler. We'll be doing the news in the second portion of the show. The first part of the show is an interview that we had with a woman named Gita Mehta, a Jain scholar from Sumaya University in India. But what's remarkable about Gita is that she worked and traveled with Vinoba Bhave of the land gift movement in India. Vinoba was considered Gandhi's number one satyagrahi, one of his, considered his spiritual successor. So working with Vinoba was an incredible experience. Michael, do you want to say anything? No, only that uh, she and her husband, Gita, and her former husband, he's gone now, have written quite a bit about Gandhi, uh, handbooks of Satya, on Satyagraha. Mm-hmm. And I have a bit of a personal connection because it was Gita who nominated me for the Bajaj Award that I got in 2007 for the uh, distribution of Gandhi, promotion of Gandhian values outside India. Right. So Gita is a very special woman and get to hear her story and the way that the legacy of Mahatma Gandhi came to her through Vinoba Bhave. So let's turn to Gita Mehta. So what is your name? My name is Gita. Uh, it is the holy book of Hindus. And this name is given to me by Vinoba Bhave because he asked me that when you are in a city like Bombay, where there are so many attractions, how did you come to me? And I said I used to go to one school on Bhagavad Gita. And therefore, he named me as Gita. So uh, this is how, and I started with uh, uh, the place where 20 dacoits, well-known dacoits, surrendered to him. uh, And the military man also was with us. Because when they surrender, they should not run away. That was the thinking of military men. But they will not. Once they surrender themselves on their own, they will not run away. It was Bindu Murena, near Agra, uh, Taj Mahal, and there they surrendered. The their poetry started with their uh, vengeance with uh, different families, and that is how they have taken up the poetry. But in the heart of their heart, I mean, these decoits also used to meet together and sing Ramayana at night. Mm-hmm. So in the heart of their heart, it was not, but. The, that family has done like this, so why should I not do? Like that, vengeance was there. But it it, it was washed off um, by surrendering themselves to Vinoba. And uh, afterwards, uh, they knew that they will have to go to jail, so they went to the jail also. But after um, punishment, on then when they were also rehabilitated by our Subarao, who met and then they are given the land to work for. And so from destructive uh, action, they have transferred themselves to constructive work. There was an episode where the uh, Indian Army was about to go into Trumbull Valley to rout out the Dacoits, and it happened that Vinoba was coming through. And they said, don't go in that valley. It is infested with Dacoits. And he said, don't use that language. It's not infested. It's inhabited by people who are doing dacoity. So he went in there, and he offered them, surrender to me, because he is a spiritual stature, so you can do this in India. Surrender to me, and you will be punished, but then there will be no vengeance taken against your families and so forth. So there's a famous picture of a Vinoba sitting under a tree, 
Looks a little bit like you, actually. And these dacoits have come, and they've unslung their very expensive rifles and telescopic sights and taking the, the dust of his feet. So I always use that as an example that this is a way to overcome terrorism because those people were, in effect, uh, domestic terrorists. That is what I told him, that in the heart of the heart, we, all of us, I mean, all human beings have the capacity of love, not only tendency of love and compassion and kindness. So if that is developed, if that is brought out, then then it nonviolence is really possible. And when I was talking to him, I said, violence has gone to its highest peak. Rather than now atom bomb, we cannot find any higher which can which can ruin the whole world. So I now there is a possibility. I mean, now there is a challenge, either accept nonviolence or non-existence, and we are not foolish enough to <laughs> accept non-existence. That whole the world is ruined, and therefore people will come to and people have to come to nonviolence, love, compassion. Uh, maybe the process is slow. But it will be stable. And in violence, uh, the result we may find, oh, they have won. America has won, all these. Uh, but uh, it will not remain for a longer period. A lot of people have heard of Mahatma Gandhi, obviously, but fewer people know about who Vinoba Bhave was. So can you give us a, a sense of who this person was and and what his legacy is. So maybe start off with his childhood and how he ended up coming to Gandhi. He was born in 1895 in Maharashtra. And, uh, of course, that was the time of uh, Gandhian movement. I mean, not at, may, may not be at the time of his birth. Gandhi may be in South Africa. But when he was young, he was... Uh, uh, he came to Baroda for education with his father, and his father was serving the king uh, at Baroda. So he came there, and there the uh, they have a group of students who were thinking of the country, how to um, how to get freedom of our country. That they were thinking. At the same time, he had also uh, inclination towards. Uh, Upanishadic sages and the Munis and all that. So uh, he was studying and he wanted to offer Sanskrit, but his father said, no, you have to offer French in school. So he did offer, but he studied Sanskrit on its own. But at that time, he had to come from Baroda to Bombay for appearing exam, for college exam. And then, uh, then he thought that by these exams, I'm not going to serve the Britishers. I mean, the exams were meant in such a manner that you become clerk of British people. So I don't want to serve them. So why should I appear for exam? And then at Surat, he changed his route. And he took another train and went towards Himalayas. And uh, when he went towards uh, Himalayas, in between, there is Varanasi, which is well known for its Sanskrit um, knowledge. I mean, that place is known as Sanskrit Nagri. That is the land, the land of um, knowing people Sanskrit and Vedas, etc. So he stayed there and started studying Vedas, etc. And there were people, uh, I mean, so-called Mahatmas, so-called. They used to say, oh, we have realization. We will make you to get realization. But he said from their life, I did not find that they have realization, looking at their life. And uh, once uh, he read the lecture of Mahatma Gandhi, which was delivered at uh, Banaras, that is Varanasi Hindu University. And there... Uh, Mahatma Gandhi blames the kings who were sitting there and the and viceroy who was sitting there that how can you, the kings, how can you wear so many jewelry and all that when our country is not free? And how can you be so quiet? 
all that appeal vinoba the he just read the speech people say he heard the speech no he read the speech and then he felt that here is a man who no who though he says that he is away from realization but he is nearer to the realization so he wrote a letter to gandhi uh, at amdavad may i come and stay with you so gandhi said yes you are welcome to come here and he went there when he went there gandhi was cutting the vegetables and uh, he asked somebody uh, may i meet gandhi where is he so that gentleman showed here is gandhi and uh, he said oh he is cutting vegetables so <laughs> uh, he said yes what does it matter he goes and cleans the toilets also and at that time toilet uh, means lifting the buckets and throwing out of the uh, village or somewhere where compost is made so he said and gandhi gave another knife to him to cut the vegetables so that was his first lesson and he started being there on the contrary yesterday i told them that uh, uh, vinoba also took up because gandhi said that if uh, europeans or britishers consider us to be untouchable and down trodden and uh, like that backward people why do we consider these people i mean those who are cleaning our toilets they are serving us why do we consider them to be untouchable so that was the first work to be done in gandhi's ashram gandhi's community center for those of you just and tuning in we're listening to geeta meta talk with us at nonviolence radio about her time with vinoba bave and vinoba bave's relationship to mahatma gandhi vinoba bave was gandhi's spiritual successor and one of the key players in the indian freedom struggle michael you had a couple of comments during this interview Uh yes I was uh, thinking that you have this very special capacity of spiritual figures in India to be third parties and this is like uh, carrying out unarmed civilian peacekeeping to an intense degree and I just have always been wondering how we can perhaps uh, duplicate or make use of that resource and uh, I I've also heard that uh, Vinoba was actually balancing between the two paths of taking to terrorism mm-hmm. or going up in the Himalayas mm-hmm. when he heard uh, Gandhi and that was the ideal resolution for him of that dilemma. Mm-hmm. Let's turn back to Geeta Mehta here on Nonviolent Radio. May I go to Pune near Pune there is a place where Sanskrit and um, Vedas are taught. May I go to Pune for for a year and Gandhi said yes you may go. but at the same time uh, afterwards gandhi realized that here is a man who has come to give something to the ashram rather than giving uh, ashram giving him something so he went to vai near pune and studied scriptures again exactly after one year he came to gandhi with his beard and all that so it was difficult for ashramites to know to uh, to recognize him and then uh, the ashramites uh, gandhi asked mahadev his personal secretary do you know who he is and mahadev said no i don't recognize who he is he is vinoba who has come back and really speaking vinoba's name was also vinayak that is ganapati uh, lord ganesh uh that name was given to him by his father but in maharashtra there is a tradition that whoever are saints ba is added to that word oh, okay. yeah danoba tukoba okay like that so gandhi said that he is vinoba vinoba is given by him so this is how he stayed in ashram uh, and he was he used to keep himself so aloof in his thinking and all that that uh, people never knew that he has so much of knowledge once upon a time he was taking bath in sabarmati river uh, early in the morning at 4 o'clock generally we people take bath every day okay <laughs> maybe it is a tradition maybe it is the requirement of the environment we get dirty 
sweat so much, so he was taking bath and he was pronouncing Vedas. So at that time, Jamnalal Bajaj, he heard it. And he realized, oh, who is he? And he waited there until the person comes out. And then he recognized that here he is, he is Vinoba. So Gandhi declared him to be the first Satyagrahi. And then people came to know that who is Vinoba? So the question was, who is Vinoba? And Gandhi had to write an article in his magazine, Harijan, who is Vinoba? And then India came to know him. Even Nehru asked, why are you making him to be a first Satyagrahi? Gandhi says he is the first person, I mean, who is real Satyagrahi. Uh, by all his vows and commitment and faith, he is a real Satyagrahi. That is what he realized. I just wanted to add that in 1942, Gandhi declared quit India, and he uh, did not want to renounce Satyagraha. He wanted to keep it going. But he also had a very important value called non-embarrassment. So while the British were fighting in Europe, he wasn't going to embarrass them. He said, for one thing, it's like having a conversation with someone and they're talking to somebody else. So you're not going to get anywhere. But for another thing, it was just basic human decency and sportsmanship. So how was he going to get out of this dilemma? He had to show that he was not renouncing satyagraha, but he was observing non-embarrassment. So he said, we're going to have a satyagraha of one. And he chose Vinoba to go and perform satyagraha and get himself arrested. So that fulfilled, got him, got him out of the dilemma. What does Satyagraha mean? And why would Vinoba then be Satyagraha, except for Satyagraha, Satyagrahi? And um, maybe also what's the significance of having a name like Vinayaka? Because maybe our listeners don't know about Ganesh. Uh, this word occurred to Gandhi, Satyagraha, occurred to Gandhi in South Africa. And formerly, Maganlal Gandhi, his nephew, suggested Sadagraha. But Sat means uh, existence. Mm -hmm. The word Sat means existence. And Agraha means force. So force of your existence. But Gandhi was not satisfied with that. And then he went on searching for another word. He um, came out with the advertisement that I would like to have a proper word for this. And then Satyagraha word came. Satya means truth. Agraha means resistance for truth. So insistence for truth. So uh, then he, uh, I mean, we say that which was... Uh, not possible for Indians because Britishers have banned any violent weapon to Indians. We cannot have rifle, no sword, no gun. And this was changed, the, the situation was changed by Gandhi into opportunity. So how can we, I don't like to word use fight, how can we meet with the, with the situation? With what a weapon we can meet the situation? And this is how he found Satyagraha. At the same time, uh, in his ashram, there were 11 vows, because one who is pure as heart, as much as pure you are, you can impress other people. Otherwise not. Okay? Uh, just talking will not serve the purpose. You yourself to be an example of, uh, of truth incarnation. And therefore, Gandhi said, uh, not uh, uh, God is truth, but truth is God. He accepted that. I mean, he changed his situation that for him. And therefore, even atheists like uh, Dr. Gora followed him for his social revolution. And their children are doing even now also. So, uh, Gora and all whoever were atheists, because uh, truth... They don't mind to accept truth as God. And uh, this is how he saw that Vinoba was the best person to be selected who has 
accepted all 11 vows of uh, ashram. He also experimented on um, charkha, the spinning wheel, and uh, um, I mean lived on the spinning wheel. He was expert in spinning. Then he had another experiment during his life, and that was Kanchan Mukti, that is not to touch any coin, n means no money, okay, in his ashram. And he was, like Gandhi, he was also experimentative. <laughs> so that experiment went on with his ashramites. So there was no light after sunset, no light and, and no salt because ashram doesn't grow salt. And whatever they were growing in the ashram, they used to feed themselves with that. Even the youngsters at that time, maybe 20, 25. So much so that, you know, I mean, the impression and the radiance of Vinoba was such that a person like Jamnalal Bajaj, who was multimillionaire, making all uh, things available, uh, Gandhi did not ask for, but whatever Gandhi thought that it should be like this, he was making available. So person like Jamnalal Bajaj also sent his children to Vinoba. Uh, children of 10, 12, and he said, this is the best education which I can provide. But Nehru said, Nehru told Jamnalal Bajaj, that what are you doing, Jamnalalji? Your children are learning from Vinoba only, and uh, your children do not go to the proper school where English is taught, etc., etc. And Jamnalal said, oh, it is, uh, it is the proper place to give them education because they will get spiritual, social, political, all kinds of education. Uh, Kamalan Bajaj and Ramakrishna Bajaj, they did not go to school, formal school. This was informal. So this was the impression of uh, uh, radiance of uh, Vinoba by which people were attracted. Only maybe few who came to know him by uh, staying nearer to him or st talking to him. Uh, Jai Prakash Narayan once went to meet him and then uh, um, Vinoba was working with well and giving uh, water to the plants. By Rahet, it is known, it moves round and round and, and pours for water into the farm. So Jai Prakash went there and was asking question to him about communism and socialism because Jai Prakash was communist yeah. in the beginning. So then he turned to Gandhian ideas and uh, Gandhi said about Jay Prakash that if I, uh, when I die, Jay Prakash will talk in my language. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, Gan the other uh, rope, the other end of the rope was given by Vinoba to Jay Prakash Narayan, catch hold of it and move with me to plant the waters. This, is, this was his life. And from the very beginning, I mean, he believed in uh, religious unity. And he said in these days of science and uh, technology, we cannot survive with our narrow-mindedness. And that is the main important work which he has done, mm -hmm. that he has taken out essence of Quran, himself studied Arabic himself, then studied uh, uh, Bible, essence of Christian teachings, then essence of Dhammapada, Buddhist, essence of uh, Bhagavad Gita itself is essence, but yet uh, among the Hindus, Bhagavad and Manusmati, these uh, are given to us in essence. Not to study, I mean, whatever are eight, eleven things which belong to that period is to be removed. Whatever is permanent, eternal, mm -hmm. those ideas are to be gathered together. Mm -hmm. And that is the most thing. Moreover, he has also prepared a five-line um, prayer in which, the, in which the names of all religions of God are included, that prayer. And at least, I, I, I don't know about whole of India, but at least in Maharashtra, mm. all schools have that prayer every day mm. before they start. You can share the prayer. Om Tat 
तत्सारायण तो पुषोत्तम गुरु तो सिद्धबुद्ध तो स्कंद विनायक सविता पावक तो ब्रह्मस्तु यौवशक्ति ईशु पिता प्रभु तो रुद्र विष्णु तो राम कृष्ण तो रही मताओ तो वासुदेव गो विश्वरूप तो चिदानंद हरि तो अद्वितीय तो अकाल निर्भय आत्मलिंग शिव तो ओम तत्सत श्री नारायण तो पुरुषोत्तम गुरु तो रहीम कुरान इस्लाम ताओ चाइनीज रहीम ताओ तो यौव शक्ति तो यहोवा यहोवा सो ऑल द नेम्स ईशु पिता क्राइस्ट फादर इन दैवन ईशु पिता प्रभु तो सो ऑल द रिलीजियस नेम्स आर इंक्लूडेड इन प्रेयर and he said the main important thing is that in these days we cannot i mean it has to go the the party politics which divides the people and the parochial religion which also divides the people it happens in india so that has to go these are the days of science and spirituality science and humanity same human beings everywhere whether uh, down trodden or Uh, uplifted or white and black whatever it may be same humanity everywhere. these are the days of science and spirituality that was gita meta talking with us from the meta center for nonviolence and here on nonviolence radio we get to share that interview michael you had a couple of last comments on this interview with gita indeed i i wanted to talk about vinoba's two uh, projects uh, what really made him world famous he decided to set out on foot and go from village to village in every village there was the basis the germ of the terrific inequality that we're suffering from today in and there it was land so there were peasants who had no land and there were wealthy landowners who just kept buying it up and so he would go to these landowners and said can you spare uh, some hectares for the peasants in your village because of his spiritual stature they couldn't give it directly to the peasants you see but they could give it to a spiritual figure mm-hmm. so they they donated millions acres of land mm-hmm. and and gave it that to you know hundreds of thousands of peasant families and since then uh and he also incidentally got whole villages donated to him to redistribute mm-hmm. to among the poor and the other, and the non poor So since then this has been one of the two main thrusts of Gandhian work uh in India the one being environmental mainly against the government and co- corporations and the other being against India's own landowners there are others of course against untouchability and so forth but these are two big thrusts and for that uh, thrust that Vinoba started you might look today at our organization called Land for Tillers Freedom mm-hmm. LAFTI which is now headed up by Krishna Krishnalal Jagannathan it's a beautiful movement i hope we can maybe describe it a little bit further to you on another program mm-hmm. and if you want the full interview with Geeta Mehta you can find that at the Meta Center's website or through our podcast for nonviolence radio stay tuned for more ईश्वर अल्लाह तेरो नाम 
सबको सम्मति दे भगवान This is Nonviolence Radio, and it's time now for Nonviolence in the News to challenge the idea that only violence is newsworthy and to try to pull out what kind of image of the human being nonviolence uplifts as we're exploring all these news options. We usually go through resources, events, and then the actual news in some order, whether or not it's that one. I'm not sure. Uh, Michael Negler will correct me on that by starting us off with what a resource I have a wonderful resource Great. that fits right into the interview that we just heard, that wonderful interview with Gita, mm -hmm. Gita Mehta. And that is that there is now, as of last month, the 23rd of November, there is an official and authentic website on Vinoba Bhave's mm -hmm. life, literature, and work. It was launched appropriately in the state of Maharashtra, where he was born in the city of Pune. And this website offers a wealth of material on Vinoba, particularly on the Bhudan and Gramdan movements that I was just talking about, mm -hmm. land grant and village grant movement. They have about 400 books by and on Vinoba. And I did not realize that the output was so extensive, though I've read several of his books, including some rare books. And you can find the link on our uh, uh, the, the web version of this news broadcast. But I want to also mention that today, Vinoba has a very th flourishing ashram in the city of Paunar, which I visited. And it was, uh, at the time, it was being used for a technology, a village technology exhibit, which is extremely interesting. Everything from weaving techniques to composting toilets and all the stuff that transition towns and all of us are experimenting with today. So that'd be my first resource, the vinoba.in website. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. Now, moving a little bit further north in India, we're going to talk about the desert in Rajasthan because the Canadian scientist, uh, Dr. David Manns, invented and designed a tool that could solve the problem of uh, waterborne illness in, the de in desert water because, you know, it rains for a couple weeks a year, all the water is collected, and there's a lot of uh, disease in that water. Um, so he developed a low-cost biosand water filter that effectively removes all dissolved particles and pathogens from water. And the process manages to remove up to 98% of bacteria, 100% of viruses, 99% of parasites, uh, worms, so forth, 95% heavy metals, and it eliminates illnesses like typhoid, cholera, hepatitis A, E. e. coli and other uh, really tough little things that get into your system when you drink water that isn't clean. Now, why do I share this? I share it because it's an example of constructive program on the one hand. This is something that can challenge the, the illness and poverty in our world by making a very simple solution that doesn't require pharmaceuticals. It doesn't require, you know, uh, a lot of money. These are biosand filters. But the other question is, why isn't this reported in the mainstream news? The, you know, they, they report the next issue, the next person that was harmed or that robbed somebody. But what if we had the news actually exploring seriously that, oh, my gosh, this guy really came up with a solution that's going to make people's lives better? Maybe the more people that know about this, the more we can feel good about being a human being. <laughs> So, <laughs> as a matter of fact, Stephanie, that I have a good news item for you. Uh, Jen Hoffman has created something called <laughs> the Weekly Action Checklist for Americans of Conscience. Mm -hmm. And among other things, that's exactly what it offers is good news. And again, usually these links are a little complicated to read over the air, but you can find it on our website. I guess I just want to challenge, like, why, does we, why do we have to call it good news? Why can't news <laughs> just be... Good. Yeah. No, that's why, the, for example, the word history by, by default means the history of political struggles and wars. And uh, like the history of science, history of art, history of culture, they all need qualifiers. But mm. just plain history is about fighting. Oh, that's true. You know, I have another resource for us, Michael, and this is the Laura Flanders Show, which people can find on 
truthout, truthout.org. And the last episode of this, so it's not, I don't think it's, I think it's just radio, just radio. <laughs> uh, but she explores <laughs> the problem of uh, sanctuary and the problem of claiming sanctuary while we live in a land of mass surveillance and uh, overcrowded prisons. Right. So she's doing this by linking the trans and immigration struggles in sanctuary because the most vulnerable are trans immigrants in, in that process. So it's uh, something to explore the, the intersectionality of uh, trans and immigrant struggles on the one hand, you know, going beyond the divide and conquer and uh, showing that we can work together and see that these struggles are linked for common purpose to go from immigration to mass surveillance is a big deal. Are you looking for training? Yeah. Uh, Christian Peacemaker Teams has uh, training requests taken in your community, and you can contact Sarah Summers, and that's an easy one, Sarah S at cpt.org. And, of course, don't forget the Nonviolence Training Hub, which lists thousands of examples. Mm-hmm. Do you have another resource, or are I we do. going to move on to the news? Okay. Uh, I got one or two, actually. I wanted to talk about a book uh, that I've just finished, actually, by George Monbiot, who's a wonderful writer, journalist, writes for The uh, Guardian. You have Com- hearts in your eyes as you're talking yeah. about George Monbiot. <laughs> you love that guy. So this book is called Out of the Wreckage, and it talks about how to recover from the um, political disasters that we find ourselves faced with. And he spends a lot of time. George Monviat is very good on science, mm. which is another reason I li- yeah, really like, like the guy. And he, this is a quote, our extraordinary capacity for altruism and our remarkable social nature are the central, crucial facts about humankind. Yet we remain to an astonishing degree unaware of them. I emphasize that because it ties in with you what we were just saying, mm-hmm. Stephanie, about what's not covered, but also because I think we should always be on the lookout look out for what I called infra politics, that is things embedded in the culture that we don't recognize mm-hmm. as political but have powerful political consequences. Because mm-hmm. the image of the human being as not capable of cooperation and not capable of altruism, the human being as separate and competitive material fragment, is the basis of exactly the kind of politics that is kind of choking off our democracy. So in this book, uh, he shows that uh, the need for a new story, uh, which of course is a hobby of mine right now, and the intense need for community can be built into a powerful political force along the lines of the Sanders campaign. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to go on to an article that I read. This one was in the Washington Post, and it sort of relates to what you're saying about these unconscious forces that if we can figure out where they're targeting um, our insecurity and exploiting it, then we can do better. We We can build a better world together. And this was interesting. There was some researchers, there were some researchers at Yale that found there's a relationship between our sense of bodily safety and the way that we vote. And they did it, they did this experiment in a couple of ways, enough to make it newsworthy to be able to be in the Washington Post. Um, I don't know how much that's saying. Um, for So, for example, they asked people how... Uh, they're going to vote on health care, right? So before they decide their feelings about health care in this survey, they have people wash their hands. And what they found is that people who had clean hands were more responsive to more progressive views <laughs> on health care, right? Something as simple as that. Then they did another experiment where they had people imagine that you say, you are a superhero, you have a superpower, you're a superpower, what do you want it to be? You know, flying, this or that. So those people voted, and they voted the way they would tend to vote, whether they had a preconceived idea of how which team they're on in our in our process. And then they asked them the same question and ended up telling them, this time we're going to tell you your, super peer, your su- superpower is to feel safe wherever you go. That's your superpower. No matter where you go, you're safe. 
And those people who then voted differently and made different decisions about policies and so forth when they had any superpower, when they had the superpower of safety, actually voted more progressively in, the, in that study. So as, as a friend told me as we I was driving her to the, the Kaiser the other day, she said, you know, I think we think we're so rational, but we're not. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, on to the news. I'm beginning to see a kind of global revolution that's slowly mm-hmm. percolating up in the field, the sector that I used to belong to, the sector of education. I think we've mentioned that at UMass Amherst, there's now an endowed chair in a study of nonviolent direct action and civil resistance. And that was endowed by a family that wishes to remain anonymous uh, to an, with an endowment of $2.8 million. And the first, the inaugural chairholder is a very good friend of ours and nonviolent scholar, Stellan Windhagen. Then, as we know, we have these resistance schools at Harvard and Berkeley. And then there's something new that I started to report on last uh, episode, but got a little bit wrong. It's the Global Center for Advanced Studies. It has a branch in Ireland that is offering free advanced degrees. But it is really based uh, in uh, Michigan and New York uh, for, for its other components. Anyway, uh, the other thing is to mention that there are now 5,500 K through 12 schools in the U.S. that have already gone solar, and that means that about five percent of all K through 12s in the nation are solar powered. Awesome. Something could certainly spread from there. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to move over to another more thoughtful piece. This one I found in Truthout, uh, Jennifer Mersica, and she points out that there is a relationship between accountability and retweeting, <laughs> and, and it's, there's also a rhetorical element involved. What, what am I saying? That if you have, if you're just retweeting somebody, are you responsible for the content? Did you say it or did they say it? And um, what's really the question there is that it's been said and that you're helping to spread it. Right. So that's the where we want to keep our eyes on accountability. But it's called paralipsis, and it's the just saying effect. I didn't say it; you said it. So, I I'm not to be responsible. And anyway, there's certain people that use that to their advantage in order to spread division and hatred. And so it's a strategy. It's a real strategy piece because it's hard. It it's a can of worms of accountability when we say who really said it. So we need to think of ways of holding people accountable for repeating things that have been harmful and uh, and having a strategy for how to deal with it. So that was just a, I thought that was a pretty interesting piece for any part of nonviolence, whether it's direct resistance, whether it's um, constructive program. You know, and I've often thought that the reason that corporations go wrong and it's so difficult for them to uh, avoid abuses mm-hmm. and and be helpful is because of the dilution of individual responsibility. You know, the the word for a corporation in German is Gesellschaft mit begrenzten Heften, which means a, a group or organization or community of people with limited liability. And it's a very dangerous thing for a person to do, to step into this gray area where you cause something to happen, but you don't feel responsible in some way. Mm. And that, 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 I think that's the cause of a lot of mischief and a lot of There needs violence. to be some real science behind that that we should begin to explore for our Science of Nonviolence page. I think we yeah. should really find it because Lisa Fuller on the haha Lisa Fuller <laughs> on <laughs> nonviolent <laughs> waging nonviolence discusses the necessity of imagining an unimaginable war. So it's I don't think in the mainstream media it's uncalled for to ask people to think about a possible nuclear war that between the US and North Korea. It's it's being discussed, it's being talked about a lot. But there is a tendency perhaps in other communities for people to uh, unplug from that and say it's impossible, it's not going to happen, it's too big. Why? She said there's actually science behind it, that there's research that suggests that our brains are, quote, to use a word that you don't like, wired, so as not to think and feel large-scale suffering. There's something in place that keeps us from feeling that suffering, which is probably uh, with, with, with 
tools like meditation and so forth, you can start to break through those and be able to sense your oneness. Um, so it's something that we need to do in this case, though, especially between North Korea and the United States. We actually need to begin to imagine that it's possible and so that we can be encouraged to act because it, it it's looking uh, pretty scary and kind of likely that it could happen. So imagining processes, I think what Lisa Fuller's work takes could uh, use is a more of an analysis of how imagining processes have worked in the positive sense in nonviolence. And so you're not starting with like a doomsday scenario that now we've all been obliterated with nuclear weapons. How did we get here? Because we didn't act. Rather say, we avoided nuclear catastrophe. How did we do it? Well, so we began organizing this way, and 10 years back we did this, and 10 years back. And so you do this long-term imagining process where it brings you all the way down to right now. What did you do today to prevent nuclear, the potential of nuclear disaster? And I think I think her piece misses that, but um, it's still worth discussing because waging nonviolence is a great resource. You know, Stephanie, I'd like to uh, add an important tie-in for that. There's a very... Uh, critical article by Henry Kissinger, which states that it's very difficult to get away with minor crimes, Mm -hmm. but you can easily get away with humongous crimes because of that same psychological phenomenon that people don't want to deal with something that's that big and that bad. Mm -hmm. And uh, those who are 9-11 truthers, for example, who uh, maintain with some good evidence that 9-11 didn't happen the way it's supposed to have happened... The reason that uh, assassinations and things like that can happen is that they're so horrendous that people don't want to know about them. Mm. And unfortunately, it would seem, and I, I don't want to be unduly pessimistic, but it would seem that the deep state has been using this this weakness. Well, there are mm-hmm. you know, a lot of people being called to action, like in the Poor People's Campaign, which is being relaunched with faith leaders nationwide. There's an escalation, it's called, a wave of nonviolent civil disobedience for some 40 days. And if you go to the website poorpeoplescampaign.org, you'll get signed up, give you a bit of the history that this is coming right from Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement. And you can read their principles. Now, the neat thing is that they ha- they actually do say they have a commitment to nonviolence in these 12 principles. But unfortunately, the commitment to nonviolence is the last principle on there. <laughs> so it's like it's like hidden in the, in the language of number 12, and it really should be number one. Um, so that's something to think about. And you'll, get, you'll, you'll even get ideas for art and so forth. Now, the question is whether or not this kind of thing is enough to pick up an, a campaign that uh, is evocative of the past and of great leaders, and to imitate it uh, is is a problem, and that's part of the um, non-creative thinking, in a way, at times of the peace movement. Is that we're just picking up old things, and then people get nostalgic, and then they get involved, but then um, they're not thinking of all the ways that nonviolence has innovated since Gandhi and King. And they don't realize also some of the deeper intricacies that these campaigns were build ups and their expression, like the poor people's campaign was the expression of something that was building up. So these are things to keep in mind. Uh, explore it, get involved as, as you can, and then also, you know, use your own discrimination for how you, you do your escalation. Absolutely. The winning formula is to cling to the principles and adapt the tactics to match the given situation. Mm -hmm. And we do often go wrong by clinging to the tactics and forgetting the principles. That's what I wanted to say. Yeah. (laughs) So, but let me talk about something rather different. It's a very nice compliment to the very active sort of thing, the very grassroots sort of thing that you were just reporting on, (laughs) Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Now, this is going to be a mouthful, so... You have two minutes. Okay. It won't be that long. (laughs) Something called the Global Resolution for the Establishment of Infrastructures to Support the Culture of Peace. And that's a resolution that has just been passed at the United Nations. It highlights peace education, among other components. What they're calling for and supporting is the creation of departments of peace within all governments, peace curriculums for peace education within schools and universities, which, as I just mentioned, is starting to creep up there, Mm -hmm. peace economics and peace businesses, and finally, the culture of peace that encourages self-transformational opportunity for individuals, 
to become agents of peace and nonviolence. And put this one in italics, and nurtures the oneness of humanity and our shared vision of peace. So that you couldn't ask for a better resolution. You know, what is the power of a resolution taken without concrete actions behind it? Not probably very much, but the possibility is there to take those concrete actions. Well, within a minute, Michael, I think you said the word peace at least 20 times, and I wanted, <laughs> and that was happening at the UN. So I'm going to jump off of that into another time that peace showed up at the UN, and this is the Nonviolent Peace Force showed up to the UN security briefing with nonviolence at a Security Council briefing hosted by Senegal, Sweden, Uganda, and the UK. It was closed to the public and reporters, so you are not getting this anywhere <laughs> else, people. The Nonviolent Peace Force was able to add to the discussion about protecting civilians in conflict by more than armed forces. And according to the founder of Nonviolent Peace Force, Mel Duncan, they did well to meet their objectives to raise awareness amongst the Security Council members about the range and potential of unarmed protection methods and that the security mem council members engaging with the UN system and civil society organizations were briefed on unarmed approaches for protecting civilians. And there was little disagreement among the people who were present. So this is really, really good news for nonviolence and, and unarmed protection in our world. Tiffany Easthom, Jilda Betancourt, Mel Duncan, uh, Tiffany Toole, all these people, Lisa Fuller, they've all been on nonviolence radio. So if you're following mm -hmm. nonviolence radio, you're following the movement of unarmed peacekeeping too. So you, you are, are on the cutting edge. <laughs> you are a part of it. And I'm so glad that Meta has consultative status now. At we, the oh, we Nations. do. That's new. Yeah. Well, we've done a lot of science today. Now, I have, I have a, a something maybe considered a bit tendentious, but there's a, a study that was commissioned by the European Union on what individual people can do to reduce their carbon footprint. And they released a film version of their results, and it's called Meat is Heat mm. or Cooking Up a Storm. The point is this. What we eat could have a more powerful effect than what we drive. Wow. That's a direct quote. Shifting to electric cars, which you and I have done, Steph, yields 96 to 104 tons of carbon reduced by 2020. But shifting to a vegetarian diet would reduce it by 264 tons. So the study is called Diet and Climate Change, Cooking Up a Storm. The main researcher was Michael Greger, MD, and it appeared in, on September 14th of a few years back originally, but now is in the Medical Nutrition bl blog for December 5th of this year. Michael, I'll give you – that was fascinating, and uh, I often find that people's – Habits around eating aren't always, again, rational, so telling them this information might not make a connection, but maybe for some it will. And it's also to explore the other ways of not um, expecting people to take in information and then change their ways, but how do we continue to gently prod <laughs> as, they, as they shift from uh, one way of life to another. But do you have any last news pieces for us? I might just mention that May Bove, who is the director now of 350.org, is talking about uh, the failure to, to stop so far the Keystone XL pipeline in Nevada, even though there was just a huge oil spill there. But she was not deterred. She said, this isn't about stopping one pop line, pipeline. Sorry, <laughs> It's about stopping a generation of fossil fuel projects that will lock us into years of fossil fuels and wreak unspeakable damage to our ultimate climate. And her plan has three main components. It's really very inspiring to read. Mobilize, organize, and train. Train a new generation of activists to stop not only this but other Pop lines, mm -hmm. pipelines. And meanwhile, there are a number of indigenous communities joining in right now in South Brule, Montana. There's another uh, Standing Rock type protest developing. So follow that with us. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael, for your help here on the news. You've been listening to Nonviolence Radio. This has been your Nonviolence in the News. I think we have done our work today to challenge that there's more than violence happening in our world, and there's a lot to analyze when it comes to nonviolence. Thanks to all of our listeners. Thanks to our mother station, KWMR. Until the next time, take care 
of one another. <laughs>